Hello, everyone. Welcome to a DuraSpace community webinar. My name is Heather Greer Klein, and I will be facilitating today's session. A few housekeeping items before we get started. For your convenience, there is a Q&A feature located in your menu. At the end of the presentation, we will be taking questions from our audience, and we'll ask you to post your questions there at that time. Today's webinar is being recorded, and both the recording and slides will be made available early next week at duraspace.org. We're pleased to have you with us today for our webinar, DSpace for Research Data Management, for Datus, a DSpace solution. Today we are joined by three presenters, Andrea Wuchner and Dirk Eisengraber Pabst from Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, and Pascal Becker from the Library Code. I'm going to turn it over to Dirk to get us started. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks, Heather, for the kind introduction. Uh, I didn't know, I haven't seen a sign. Uh, yeah, thank you as well for the invitation and the chance to talk about Fordatis here in the context of DuraSpace. Um, and I hope that Andrea Pascal can give you yeah, a first introduction a previous, yeah, of our previous results uh, we have done in the last month with DSpace as a repository for research data, um, which sure it's a DSpace solution. Um, in the overview, oh, wait a minute, we are still fighting with the presentation, thanks. Oh, there's no agenda back, so, but only what we want to do is, I will start and talk a little bit about uh, Fraunhofer. Um, very brief, but I think it's important that you know who we are, where we come from, because we have a little bit two souls in our press, like uh, Goethe Faust said once, we have an academic side and we have our RTO side, which is our research technical organization. I think that's important to know. Later on, I, um, Give over to Andrea. She will show how we made a decision for this space and what we have done in the last month in, in the practical work. Uh, later, um, Pascal will show us a little bit uh, about the customization he did with this space uh, 6.3. I think that will be very important for other people who want to do our uh, research data repository on basis of this space 2. And later, I try, um, as a last point, I want to yeah, give a short summary about um, the lesson learned we did and maybe our small visions we still had because we tried to, to show you with all the um, he headers that we are still on route, we are, we, are, we are on our way. So very brief, uh, I think to understand the organization of Fraunhofer as a RTO, as a research technical organization for applied science. Um, in a nutshell, we can use the curriculum of Josef Fraunhofer um, after whom the organization was named in 1949. Um, Fraunhofer was a researcher and an inventor, but he also was a, a businessman. And that's the history of Fraunhofer today too. Um, oh, now we have the agenda, great. <laughs> Fraunhofer today um, keeps his mission to undertake applied research that drives economic development and provides wider benefits for society. I think um, MP3 standard is well known and a good for example for that. Um, so our services are solicited by customers and partners in industry, in the service sector and public administration. Only to get you have a feeling, um, we have more than 25,000 people of staff. Um, we have 72 institutes and our research volume amounted to 2.3 billion euros. And the very important thing is here that 70% of this so-called Fraunhofer model, which is unique in German research uh, landscape, um, is done with industry partners and public financed research projects. And here, we will find the field of tension where we act as an academic institute and as a partner for industry. 
but we will see that later too. Um, I talked a little bit about the two souls in our press, and now I want to show a little bit about our academic soul, the academic side of Fraunhofer. Um, our 72 institutes are well connected with universities and University of Applied Science. Um, our directors hold chairs at universities. So we are really connected, we are a part of the academic world. Um, all of our institutes have an own library service and special library personal managers. So we have only one central institutional repository and we have, for that reason, our own history of open science. Open access, um, I think you all will know that in 2003, the Berlin Declaration was done and we have been one of the first signatories. In 2006, we, in this case, in this journey, um, we uh, opened our first open access uh, Fraunhofer ePrint server. And the most important thing I think is in 2015, we have an open uh, access strategy and we have a goal that uh, in, yeah, in two years, we will have 50% uh, uh, open access um, publications. In this context, we started with Open Data 2. It was in 2014. And we started with ev uh, an evaluation project, and then we started before that this project. So I think, as many of you know, we, we made a lot of paperwork, and we're really jumping into the water, like now going deep in, into, uh, in an implementation. We did this year with the DSpace um, project, uh, which we want to present here. Oops, sorry. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the other side to understand why we have a little special place here in Fraunhofer, open data. Because what we are doing here actually as an RTO, we are really good in patents, in IP, in intellectual property with our industry partners. I think you all know MP3 or white lead technology. We made a main part of our money with all these patents um, only that you can see how active we are in patenting and if you and you can imagine if you have data which can be the basis for patents we don't want to have an F as open data only to see in which field of tension we are living today um, then we are talking about open data which will be published in our forgotten project so, but last but not least, with all these problems, we have an, uh, an own open science vision for uh, our, um, yeah, for whole frown of a society. Um, we believe that our research process, opening research processes, uh, will lead us to our scientific output, which we still have with open access, open data, and other open source software, for example. And this output, this research output, has impact of very important fields of our society, of politics, of science and economy. And that means um, that we will have the idea that we can have new business models, uh, we can enhance research quality, we can, for example, ensure research integrity, there are a lot of benefits about that, even with our industrial partners. So um, what I want to do now is to give over to, to Andrea that she can uh, show you um, what we have done in the last month. Thank you, Dirk. Why do we care for research data? Um, publications are based on research results. Today, data as research results can easily be copied. We committed ourselves to safeguard research data that we have created at Fraunhofer Institute. As of today, many questions regarding research data are still open and unclear, especially um, um, juridical questions. Our approach is that 
we do what we can do today as good as possible and improve it whenever possible. We start right here, right now with all the knowledge we have and create something that is good for now with the option to improve it later when the open questions can be answered. So we create a solution as fast as we can and improve it instead of never ending discussions without any solution. Um, repositories for research data versus repositories for publications. Um, repositories for publications are much older than repositories for research data. They have something in common. All repositories store metadata and styles. The difference between a repository for research data and one for publications are the type of styles. Um, here we have not only PDFs or um, but we have tables, we have source code, statistics, proprietary data, audiovisual data, and so on. So we store any kind of a file a researcher considers to have a scholarly uh, value. Um, what were the things we had to consider? We had to work together with researchers while planning, building and running the repository in order to meet their requirements and to create uh, acceptance for the repository. Um, we um, had to work together with them to identify file formats that can be considered to be lasting and adequate for reuse. Um, we need to find out as good as possible what researchers and the organization needs. And we had to include as much of the whole organization as possible while planning the workflows. So we had not only um, researchers to work together with, but um, people from headquarters, um, the institute's libraries, um, uh, to um, create um, a repository that is fitting to Rauno for internal workflows. Um, our approach was for to build a repository for the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. Um, there was a preparation period of the internal project for DATIS. Um, and for DATIS strives to establish a repository called for DATIS2. Um, so we had to work together with all the stakeholders to identify the needs and to build a first version of the repository. Um, we did a survey among researchers and um, infrastructure people about their data, about their needs, about the services that are already running um, and um, about the knowledge they have on research data management. Um, so we built the repository in a very short time. The implementation was done from June to November uh, 2018, together with the firma, the, uh, together with the company, the library code, and uh, right now we are in a period of testing, of gaining experience, and making enhancements to the repository. So um, work is still in progress, and we are very focused to um, get the repository started. Um, Further things we had to consider. Um, a repository is an infrastructure in an existing, existing ecosystem. Fraunhofer um, uh, is still running uh, some piece of infrastructure uh, and has its organizational um, requirements and the repository had to be created that way to fit in this infrastructure and to um, be a part of that. Um, the further things we had to consider were a lot of important conventions for repositories. You can't build repository only um, um, by your own. You have to consider the conventions that are in a repository community, that are in the scientific community, and um, these are using persistent identifiers, be open, be fair, um, create and publish policies regarding long longevity and reuse of data, use common protocols uh, like sitemaps or the OIE PMH um, interface to export data, um, 
create typical workflows of repositories um, that enable self-submission, that enable quality assurance, and be part of a community. Um, why we made the DSpace decision? Um, first of all, there were technical requirements. There were functional requirements and there were use cases we um, created from what we know about Fraunhofer, what we know about the researchers and that are um, conformed to existing um, workflows for um, publication. And um, we did a um, survey too, um, like I mentioned, to ask researchers and infrastructure people about their requirements. And we analyzed the requirements and we, um, and we um, did some test installations of several systems to um, have a, um, a first um, overview of all the possible solutions. Then, um, criterion for exclusion, we um, wanted to use an open source product um, to enhance the open science um, approach even in this um, level. We um, wanted to have a product with a strong community, um, that means um, many, many people, a big community, but it also means um, a well-organized community behind the product. Um, we, um, uh, a further indicator that we um, wanted um, to rely were a large number of installations. So there are a lot of DSpace installations, um, what was a further point for us. And um, we wanted a product that um, supports Serif and Sparkle technology. And um, we um, had, for Dartis, it's not only a, a single system, but um, we have the Fraunhofer Publica, the bibliograph bibliographic database, and combined with the um, ePrints, the publication repository. And um, it was clear that we will, um, in the future, um, migrate the old Publica to a new system. And we would like to um, combine these two systems. So we wanted um, some um, CRIS compatibility compatibility. So we decided um, for, uh, for us, for our use case, DSpace was the best decision. And we choose DSpace um, 603 because um, it's uh, used very often and it, we couldn't wait until DSpace 7 to be released. We wanted to start here and now for a solution. So what were our functional requirements? One of our requirements was descriptive metadata. Since the scope of our data was all the research data from heterogeneous disciplines within Fraunhofer, we need a one-size-fits-all metadata approach. A set of metadata that can describe research data as a, at a generic level. We strive to use wi widespread elaborated standards and controlled vocabulary wherever available. Further, we wanted to enable harvesting via OIE PMH um, for several use cases like DOI assignment or harvesting the EU platform um, open air. Um, we did several mappings like to data site. Um, internally, this space works with the Dublin core standard so we defined the requested elements and their occurrence and created all necessary mapping. Um, the metadata profile is uh, right now implemented. All fields are available, available in the input screen. 
uh, further requirement also with regard to the new publica is authority data. We strive that resources like projects, persons, organizations are represented as own unique entities for a better and more precise metadata quality to deliver more information for each of the entities. Um, the entities can also be linked with each other. Most of these requirements we will address with the new publica. For DARTIS, the Dewey Decimal classification for subjects um, are available and a relation between publications and research data. Um, besides that, for DARTIS will offer the following references to research data. Um, if part of has part is based on references, is referenced by requires um, URI supplemented by, supplemented to, and is generated by. Um, to be compliant to the FAIR principles promoted by the European Commission, we had to, imp oh sorry, uh -huh. no, since Horizon 2020 and its compliance requirements were one of our starting points, we had to take the FAIR principles into account, since Horizon 2020 promotes them very strongly. Um, we had the possibility to get an evaluation of our data um, against the FAIR principles to check um, if we are compliant. And you can see here the results. Most of them are green and yellow. We, um, are, very, we are not bad um, in fulfilling the requirements. Only we have two red spots, metadata, longevity, um, which will... Um, which will be answered by um, a long, long, long witty concept for the metadata. And um, meeting community standards, the problem um, of this requirement is there aren't community standards in the world yet so that we um, can um, implement them. Um, the, here is very, very, um, much work going on. We will be there in a few years, but right now it is difficult to fulfill this point. Um, further requirement um, is organizational embedding. Um, we have to um, make sure that the data from the researcher um, goes into the repository in a quality assured way. So we um, um, did the concept of a three-step workflow where the data, uh, where the scientist who is creating the data um, entered, ingests the data with the metadata into a repository, the institute's library checks it, um, uh, they can um, edit the metadata and finally there is one central um, quality assurance where the data finally is released. Um, further, um, there is um, not at the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft research data man management from cradle to the bear is not um, um, provided yet. Um, there is a huge um, di digitization project where Fraunhofer will take this questions into account. Um, for that is there's only the tool for uh, publication of data, not for um, management in the labs, not for um, archiving. I, and um, in, in um, this project, um, the repository has to be um, connected with um, the, the infrastructure that is built there and therefore um, a Sparkle endpoint for linked data is needed. So now um, I'm presented to the requirements and Pascal Becker will talk about these based customizations for Frown. Hello from my side. The library code was very happy to be working on for data together with Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. And we were looking deeply in what we can do to make the best out of DSpace for Fraunhofer. If we, with regards to research data, we have to consider that DSpace is quite fit already because as mentioned before, research data repositories are also 
just handling files and metadata as publication repositories. If we are looking on, on this space, we see the two user interfaces we currently do have, JSPUI and XML UI. And the JSPUI already contain, contains a modern resumable upload mechanism. That means that if you do, if you upload big files, so the, the size of files is, is something that differs between publication repositories and research, research data repositories. And if you upload big files in JSPUI, they are getting chunked into smaller pieces and are transferred piece by piece to the repository and reassembled on the server side. And that's really helpful for it. But it's already built in, in these spaces. Nothing we had to do for this project especially. What is really great in these spaces is that you can add your own metadata fields. And we used this a lot. We, we had some more fields we needed to, to, for example, to handle Fraunhofer institutes, Fraunhofer groups, clusters, things like this. And um, we, we customized, of course, the submission form to have all the fields in a, in a good way in it so that data can be entered into the repository easily. We are using, of course, the workflows that most of the repositories are using as, as um, Andrea just described, described um, where um, uh, researchers are um, self-submitting data. So um, it's quite important to, to, to support this with a good submission form. We decided to hide the community and collection list and use browse indices instead. And um, also here, we are quite happy with DSpace because it's um, just a configuration to say we need a new browse indice for, for, for a metadata field and DSpace is doing everything behind the scenes on its own after it got the configuration. So for Fraunhofer, we introduced a new browse indices for the list of institutes, groups and clusters. Um, and are using that instead of the common community and collection list. What we did a lot was changing the layout to achieve the style of Fraunhofer publications. And we put a special focus within the layout work on the item view. Um, we wanted to put the content really into the center of the item view. So you will see an example in a minute on the next slide. Um, we wanted to get away of this traditional way of this space where it's showing the metadata data in a table and wanted to have a title um, in a style where you just, just see that that's the title and the affiliation right below it. We wanted to, to push the important informations like DOI, DC type, date issued, um, further in front using batches for that. And um, we wanted to, to get a solution for long abstracts. So we, we find a way to collapse long metadata fields um, and long file lists. Um, even with research data, we expect a lot of uh, PDF files because most of the research data will need some documentation. How was it constructed? How was it generated? What were the experiments that were run to, to get the research data? How can they be re reused? And these informations are normally put into PDFs. So we added a PDF preview directly uh, into the item view. That's the item view we did. What you see here is the layout also that um, Data will have. So you see um, there's a new navigation bar, you see the Fraunhofer logo, of course, and, and the colors that Fraunhofer is using on the publications. And um, as I explained, we really got rid of this metadata table and instead um, we were focusing on, on the contents of the items. The other point that we found was really important as well is to, to push the, the files more to the top of the space. So if you open an item view, on, on, a, on a normally sized screen um, that you have direct access to the files of the item and not only to the metadata. That was also something that, that we found very important. Um, what you see here also is that um, the files are truncated, as I explained, show five more files is written over there. You see that um, the authors, the editors, and uh, are tr truncated as well and are linked to the, to the browsing essays we put, for, put out for this and also the um, different institutions, affiliation we are showing on, in this test um, item are linked with, with indices. So to sum it up, to, to bring it all to, an, to a big overview, I will hand it over again to Dirk. Thanks, Pascal. Oh, that's a great task to, handle, <laughs> to bring all together. Um, <clears throat> lesson learned might perhaps a way to bring all together. I think um, the first lesson we have is that we are still learning. Um, research data management is really, I think, still a new development. I know there are a lot of 
papers uh, done and you can find it on open access repositories how you can do it and I think there are a lot of um, research data repository out there in the academic world but I think we all we, we who we are working with these repositories we are still learning so I think we have unanswered questions and I think what we really learned is do now start now and try to do what's possible today and then we will do the best um, improving what we have done um, sure we learned a lot about what you always learn in big projects even if you're talking about um, data because this data uh, should be linked to other data normally publications for example software etc um, that's very very um, interesting what, what we are still trying to do and what our vision is it might be our last slide um, I think what we really learned too is that uh, if you remember uh, the slide which was presented by Andrea about the criterion of exclusion we had one criterion of exclusion about um, the community um, if you're working or preparing a repository on basis of open source software the community uh, is very important and what we really learned in the project is that the dspace community is very active and well organized we always could find information out there and this year in germany uh, the german um, dspace <coughs> consortia was founded uh, which was is very helpful in future i hope um, for the further development of um, for data uh, of eSpace, sorry. <laughs> um, and for that, the very thing is we learned is we are highly awaiting DSpace 7 because there we, maybe we will find some entities more which should be very important even if you want to connect uh, research data with entities like projects, um, etc. Um, that's something what we are really waiting for. Uh, another thing is but I think it's uh, uh, a lesson learned in other bigger projects too, that it's not only the technical implementation, the organizational implementation, embedding it to in, 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 the, in the existing um, circles and multi, uh, multiplier groups uh, that the researchers will use uh, uh, research data repository, which we all know is very difficult to, to show the benefit why somebody uh, should use it um, is a very, uh, very important thing too. That's a lesson we learned uh, very hard. Um, as I think we all told you, we are still on route. Uh, the next steps for us will be uh, to, to finish the implementation. We are still working with a beta version. We are testing, doing adjustments. Uh, yeah, we are starting documentation, what we all love to do. Um, go live oh uh, it, it's a hard question I, I would say spring next year um, and during all that time we are working uh, on the organizational embedding uh, we are still working on submission workflows because um, we wanted to establish a service for uh, our uh, scientists and you're working on the communication to communicate why somebody should use uh, a open, uh, open, yeah, uh, a, a research data repository for open data. What, what is the benefit? I think that's the main question we always want to answer to our science, scientists and researchers. Um, this is a picture which shows our creator vision because I told you before that. We have two souls in our press. We have a lot of data which won't be open. And we started now with Fordatis for open data, but we have a lot of other data too. And this data should be linked. We want to connect it. Sure, it won't be open for other people, but this is very important why we use a DSpace 2 because there we have a full RESTful API to connect different items with other items that will be only internal. Only that you have a vision what we want to do, it's the general vision that we sure we generate data that will be, if you look on the right side down there, say we have publication systems. We have normal publications, we have uh, open data, and in future we will have some open source software there too. We will connect uh, this data and bring it to a data warehouse 
And over this layer, we can do all the business intelligence we want to do. That's our great vision, uh, what we want to do at the end. Um, yeah, our vision is maybe that's a mixture of, of our vision and what we have done in the last month, because we had one big question is, do we really want to mix the data? And actually, as <clears throat> Pascal said, DSpace is perfectly prepared to handle with all data as you know, and not only PDF, other data too. So what is the reason really to, to divide uh, into different um, repository systems? Um, so we actually were forced by, yeah, by reality because we have an existing publication infrastructure which will be changed now too. And we have a bigger project which is called Pound of a Digital which has the idea of connecting, linking all the different silos in our institute we have. So we said, if we are waiting again, doing plans and paperwork, we said, start now. We start now before DACIS. We bring in there the open um, research data, and then we can do linking and uh, we can connect it uh, over API, a RESTful API, um, to get all the benefits out there. But once we have to start, and that's, I hope, vision we all tried to show you we, we had a lot of plans done but once there is yeah there is, is, is a moment you have you have to start working on it and to make it better i think it was a yeah very brief um, overview of what we have done in the last three four months and sure uh, the years before and i hope you could appreciate it you had I hope you have a lot of questions and I hope you can answer it. And yeah, thank you a lot for listening and thinking. Uh, and yeah, we are pleased to hear your answer, uh, your questions. Thanks. Are you here? Yep. So that was the presentation. We are ready for, for questions. Are there questions? Excellent. Yes, yes, we're it's now time for our audience to ask their questions. <clears throat> if you'll please put them into the Q&A panel. And panelists, we already have one question. Um, how many people were involved in the development and customization process and how long did it take you? I think that's a question uh, Pascal has to, uh, to, to answer, yes, please. So first of all, one part is the DSpace community altogether, because without DSpace 6.3, without the things we, we do have over there, um, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, if you're taking the DSpace 6.3 release as it is, putting it into the, the form for data as today, we were working on this um, as two people, basically, together with, with, with the team at Fraunhofer working on this, um, the concept the, the ideas, the concept, conceptual part was done together in, in, in basically in three big workshops. Um, the hard technical implementation were two people at the library group doing. And the time, maybe for the month, so as we showed out, the whole project was with the first workshop looking together, the second workshop focusing on the metadata schema. Um, the, the total project was, was running from June to November. Excellent. We have another question. <clears throat> Which metadata standard did you choose? We, um, our starting point were the requirements. Um, and um, this was the DOI um, and the mapping to open air. And these both requirements required the data site standard. So we, um, um, we um, created the first uh, version of a metadata profile as a data site. Then later we had a decision for DSpace. And DSpace internally works with the Dublin Core standard. So we trans transformed the data site standard into the Dublin Core standard and we um, deliver the DOI and the open air requirement by mapping. And I think there was some part of the 
know, when you're looking into the other Fraunhofer specific metadata, and you know, Office 366 comes out of the box with a local metadata schema where you can add your own fields. And um, we did this to, to get a feeling for, um, to, 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 we use this to, to, to put in the information that are really Fraunhofer specific. So for example, the Fraunhofer Institute that we mentioned, the Fraunhofer groups, things like this are in our local metadata schema. So further questions, please. And we'll give attendees a minute to type any other questions you might have into the Q&A panel and we'll read them for our presenters. Okay, we have another question. Are you planning to have a dedicated team to manage the research data curation process? What are the skills required for this job? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, in fact, there are two steps of metadata quality assurance. Um, the first step will be within the institutes, the so-called Fachinformationsmanager at Fraunhofer, um, often um, identically to the institute's library, um, should um, take this um, this task and there will be um, a, a team uh, within the uh, um, Competence Center Research um, Services and Open Science, our Competence Center, where the final um, quality assurance um, of the metadata um, will take place. Um, what the um, qualifications are or the um, required um, um, competences, um, there are um, li library competences like metadata standards. There will be a guideline, a rule um, that um, defines um, what um, information in what form should be uh, in what field. Um, that uh, could be a, um, a good foundation for the data assurance process. And um, so, um, the, the, the competences are librarian and you can say that um, data curator, the competence of a data curator and data curation um, that um, is um, evolving now, um, a, a, a sort of librarian that is um, with new tasks and new competences um, that um, will be the competences that will be need. Um, I think um, at the first step, when we roll out the repository, um, we will um, deliver training for the people and um, the, 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 um, who, the guidelines um, that we will set um, off and uh, um, the metadata knowledge of the librarians um, will be the competences needed for the start. Excellent. We have another question. Do you already have some real-time data for testing? Yes, um, we collected a data set um, for testing that um, is not too large yet, but there are interview data um, stored um, as CS CSV um, that are um, survey data stored as PowerPoint. There are proper data um, created um, by simulations for um, for tissue, for tissues, and um, there that and um, further interview data, and that is the set we started off. Um, yes. And this data um, are created in the research pro in the real research process. Great. Our next question is: Do you plan to make your metadata mappings available for others to use? Um, oh. 
so regarding the metadata, we have to, I would consider to look on the already. This uh, mapping of common core. Oh, if you could just move a little closer to the mic, you're breaking up just a bit. Sorry, if you're looking to DSpace, you will notice that there is already a mapping included from, data, from Dublin Core to data site. So data site is used within DSpace to, to mint DOIs. And um, while minting the DOIs, um, you have to transform the data to uh, the, the Dublin Core metadata to, to the data site standard uh, metadata schema. And that's already built in out of the box of, uh, in DSpace 6. Um, regarding the, the Fraunhofer specific uh, metadata fields, metadata schema fields, I don't think that it is really helpful for others to, to get these because as mentioned they are specific to, to, to Fraunhofer and, and the environment we, we found here. All right. If our attendees have any additional questions, I'll give you a moment to put them into the Q&A. So I think the central message of, the, of our talk were quite clear, but there's one thing we really wanted to put out and, and I hope you get it all. Don't be afraid of research data, just go and start. The, the DSpace, DSpace, the repositories you, you probably have with DSpace already are well suited for that. So um, go ahead and, 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 and just get into the material. Excellent, and we do have another question. Um, how many platforms were reviewed before selecting DSpace? Um, that were about uh, four, three or four of the most common, most wide, widespread um, platforms. Okay, if there are no additional questions. On behalf of DuraSpace, I want to thank you, Dirk, Andre, and Pascal for sharing this information with us. And thank you all for joining us today. This concludes our session. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thank you. Goodbye, I hope you enjoyed it.